in the previous conversation, you, you spoke about the calculus conspiracy, right? Um, you were saying, I paraphrase, I think we should be introducing calculus much earlier than the 12th grade. I never took calculus, right? And I graduated college, so I'm just going to put that out there. Um, and I graduated from a good school, too. So <laughs> I think, all right, so I'm paraphrasing. You said, I think we should be introducing calculus much earlier than the 12th grade when uh, most get it, if they get it at all. It just shows that the goal is not really for us to get to calculus, and calculus is the gatekeeper to higher graduate level math. Uh, why do you think everyone's not being exposed to calculus? Well, I mean, it, it helps to maintain the status quo because, like I like I said, like you know, calculus is really that that gateway to higher level graduate math. Like so, you know, because after calc one, then it's calc two, then it's calc three, differential equations, and a whole host of other classes. And a lot of people that have opinions about calculus and about math have never taken calculus. You know, they just know it's like the way it's marketed to us, it's this really hard class for really smart people. And if you never sat in a calculus class, like you might be intimidated by it, but there's a lot of algebra in it. So, you know, I think that it should be introduced earlier and we could introduce it a lot earlier because a lot of the concepts, when we introduce calculus concepts, we revert and refer back to geometry concepts, algebra one concepts, like the slope, slope of a line. Everybody always talk about, I'm never gonna use Y equals MX plus B. Well, the slope of a straight line is relevant to the slope of the tangent line to a curve that we that we deal with in calculus one, right? So I'm like, if you a child and you can understand, you know, the slope of a line, then you can understand that same slope, you know, in a calculus scenario. Now, of course, it, you know, you still need a lot more prerequisites to get a full understanding of the you know the whole range of all calculus topics. But some things can be introduced at an early age, you know. And I think about. Um, the ancestor, the late uh, Bob Moses, Bob Moses, who was co-author of Radical Equations, him and Charles Cobb, they was in SNCC together back in the 60s and whatnot. And in his book, he said that, well, in his work, because he, he's the architect behind the algebra project and the work that they've been doing. And, you know, he said his goal for his organization was he wanted to prepare students to be calculus ready by the, by, by the end of 12th grade. And I'm saying like, I like that, but I'm saying like, let's, let's, let's leverage that and go beyond and even start like offering calculus like at the middle school level, you know, middle school level and whatnot. And just kind of just, you know, just see what happens. Because that's how you really like, you know, get into, get into STEM anyway. Yeah. You know, you get people to like major in math and then, because when, when, you, when you get that deep into the math, whether you're doing applied math or pure math, you start to see the beauty of math. And a lot of people that walk around talking about I hate math or, you know, they kind of, you know, shudder and get all nervous when somebody even start talking about math or whatever. like. They never get to the point where you start to see the beauty in it and you start to see like the fun in it and like the, you know, just the different aspects. And you start to see like how this can help you in everyday life. And uh, for those unaware, can you give an example how calculus applies to everyday life? It's about like the rate of change, like measuring, measuring the rate of change, um, speed of a car. Right. So, you know, calculus can basically be broken down into two, two general parts. Right. So you got uh, the rate of change. Right. When you're dealing with like velocity, like your car is sitting still. Right. When you hit the gas, it starts moving. Right. So the, the location of the car, the position of the car is changing. Right. But then if you're not going to consistent speed, like let's say because you, you're not if you're driving in the streets, you're not going 40 miles per hour the whole time because you got to stop at stop signs. You got to stop at red lights. If you're on the highway, you might accelerate, get in the fast lane, get out the fast lane, you know, whatever. Right. So you're going at different speeds at different times. So then acceleration comes into play. So calculus is a way to, you know, measure that as well. Then we got optimization problems, right? So let's say you got a certain amount of money and you got to do a certain amount of things with the money. We can use calculus to figure out, okay, like what's the maximum I could get with this amount of money, right? That's optimization. Then another part of calculus, we deal with integrals and we deal with like area, but the area of like weird type looking shapes. Because everything ain't just like a nice, neat square, rectangle, triangle, trapezoid or whatever. We got, you know, straight up formulas for that. But what if it's like something weird, like part of it looked like a circle, then part of it looked like a trapezoid, then part of it looked like a straight line, you know, like, you know, so calculus can like answer those questions, you know, um, and it does get complex. But again, back to, you know, what I always say, math is really about problem solving. It's about helping to develop us to be able to solve problems. Right. So the more complex the math is that we're doing we're preparing ourselves to solve more complex problems in our everyday lives outside of a classroom, just walking down the street or just dealing with and interacting with other human beings, you know? And also uh, you mentioned the beauty of math. Could you mm -hmm. give an example for those unaware? What, what would be an example of the beauty of math? 
the beauty of math, like, you know, one of the, one of the things that I think about when I think of the beauty of math is like the fact that you can like solve a problem in multiple different ways and you get the same exact answer. And you start to see like the relationships and how things are equivalent. Like, you know, using the distributed property versus using a traditional algorithm that you might have learned or, you know, just different different ways. Like, you know, it's just to me, it's just a beautiful thing. Cause it, it all it all it shows how it's, everything's interconnected. You know, and then even like with geometry, right? Um, there's a sister, uh, another ancestor from out of Baltimore, Dr. Gloria Gilmer. She did a lot of work with ethnomathematics, which is basically ethnomathematics just basically means how is math used within different cultures. So she did a lot of work studying like in the African African and African American culture, like how we use math or how math represents itself and presents itself, right? So she was very interested in like, you know, braids and cornrows and the different tessellations, because like that's another issue of beauty, right? So like you see a sister, she got a braids freshly done, not some knotless braids or some cornrows or something, and you know, everything is like laid and it's like and it's a, it's attractive to us, right? We're we we're attractive to, we're attracted to the geometry. The geometry and the patterns and the balance and the symmetry and everything, you know, it's, 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 it's nice and neat and put together. That's what we're really attracted to. We don't know it. Part of the reason we don't know that and we don't think that is because all our lives we've been told math is irrelevant and don't have nothing to do with our daily experience. But what we really like is that that symmetry and like how everything is like is design, patterned. Yeah. Right. The tessellations, the parts, the little squares or the trapezoids or the rectangles or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So like. That's another manifestation of like the beauty of mathematics that we don't really talk about because we don't, you know, we don't, a lot of times in the geometry class, the geometry teacher, myself included, I was guilty of this early in my career. I wasn't having that conversation with my students in geometry. And when I was early in my career, I'm straight like, you know, just trying to get them to memorize the theories, memorize the formulas. And that's not the most effective way to teach because it was, I was keeping it abstract. I wasn't bringing it into, I wasn't bringing it into daily life. And like, how is this relevant to your daily life? You know? And, and you brought up another great point. I was listening to you, right? Do you think that's one of the biggest issues with math and students is the fact that the teachers that are teaching the math aren't really well versed in math? I definitely do. A lot of, a lot of ma math teachers don't know math for real. They don't know it. When I, and when I say that, um, I say that for different reasons. One reason is a lot of us back in the day that ended up becoming teachers, we were taught in math in terms of algorithms. Meaning, just memorize this formula, memorize this process, and just use it and get to the answer. Kind of like when we was young playing video games. Just try to get to the next, beat the level, go to the next level, beat that level. But we never thought about, or we never were taught about the concepts behind why the algorithm even works. So when a lot of parents complain about the so-called new math, they're not realizing that this is meant to explain the concept behind the algorithm. Because... A lot of times when you end up taking a standardized test or you just want to like figure something out, you know, especially when you get to the higher level math, like we were talking about calculus. Calculus is very conceptual. A lot of times it's not just a straightforward algorithm or formula just to that you can use to solve a problem. Sometimes you got to like piece things together and put two and two together and figure out like, OK, well, if this this does this and that does that. How can I combine and have some type of synthesis and then figure this out? But that takes a conceptual understanding. So a lot of teachers they don't have that conceptual understanding. They don't have a conceptual background and they, they know how to teach it the way they was taught, right? And a lot of times they was taught how to do something one way. So then they try to teach the child one way. And it's like I told my students at Cheney, like you need to know how to do these problems in multiple ways because you might have a student in your class eventually, whether it's first grade, second, third, fourth, whatever, right? That doesn't understand how to do it this way that you're very well versed at teaching it, right? So you gotta you gotta know how to teach them another way because when you teach them another way, then they might understand it. And not only that, another benefit is then they might then be able to make it might make it might make the original method you tried to teach make more sense. So then it's like a two for one. So now they end up knowing two different ways out of, of doing a problem, which is just a great situation to be in. Cause you don't wanna be like locked into just like one form of problem solving. But it's just life in general, fire. You can't, you gotta know how to do things many different ways, you know? Yeah, cause you can't just be like, you know, if I only know how to get home one way and we driving. <laughs> you have problems. And then the streets is blocked off. I'm, what I'm gonna do, just sit there, sit there in my car and be mad, just sleep in my car that night? <laughs> no, you gotta figure something out. You gotta figure out another another route to take.